Wednesday evening, please join me in standing as we stand and open the service with a great song. I know who I have believed. Think about the word. This is a great. We'll sing the first and the last. Join me on the first. Nine.
be seated tonight. For the last time for this school year, our Pee Wee Club is going to sing for us. Let's listen. Well, I just want to thank you all for giving me the privilege to work with your children. I have truly loved it. They are such a blessing to my heart. We got cut short a little bit with COVID this year, but you know what? They have been troopers. They have worked hard. They have memorized Bible verses. If you see their hats and got stars, those are Bible verses that they worked hard to memorize. And they have learned all their songs, and I'm just really proud of them. With that being said, tonight is our last night and the last time that we sing for this year, and we have some graduates. And I wanted to make sure that they got recognized tonight. So first off, we got a little gift for them. It's a little trophy. The first one is for Miss Charlotte Grant. Yay! Give her a hand. Now we have Colton Conaway. Elisa Pluck. Yay! Liam Spears. Zoe White. Alex Xavier Mann. Maddox Smith. And Jamison Jones. All right. 
Thank you all, and uh, we look forward to next year. Let's give Mrs. Oates a hand as well, and her workers did a great job. So awesome. All right, boys and girls, you can follow Miss Tori. And uh, this is a great, great group of little ones. These are just four and five year olds. And so the five year olds, they move in uh, there to Patch Club, Patch the Pirate, and into Mrs. Engler's group. And in fact, on Sunday, let me remind the parents on Sunday, there'll be Patch the Pirate Awards in the morning service. So please make sure your kids are here for that as well. Well, wonderful, wonderful way to start our Wednesday night service. I'd like to recognize Brother Dean Millirons here tonight. Brother Dean, on Friday, you are finishing an era of your life and career, are you not? Dean retires on Friday after 42 years of driving a concrete truck. Let's give Dean Millirons a big hand. I love it. I, I left the property today, Miss Millie. I don't know if you knocked on my door. I saw the little sheets on my door. I left for maybe 30 minutes, and I came back, and she had written some very nice things. Or, Dean, maybe these were things you wrote, and she just came and put on the door to read about you. I'm not sure. But I do love what you said at the bottom. He has kept a good name and a good reputation. His coworkers know that he lives for the Lord. And I think that's a wonderful reputation and testimony. So, Dean, congratulations on 42 years of driving. I wonder how many yards of concrete you've, you have poured in 42 years, huh? That's a whole bunch right there for sure. Well, I also would like to let you know that uh, we had a spring fundraiser at Martinsburg Christian Academy. And if the kids reached a certain level, was it 15,000? 10,000. Should have been 15, right? Should have been. You, you, you were thinking way too small. One of the incentives is that the principal would sleep on the church roof overnight. And that is going to happen. Is that right, Brother McRae? So why don't you come up here and tell about what, when that's going to be and how that's going to happen. I don't know if I want you all to know, but I'm going to be up there. <laughs> Start throwing rocks or something. But I've been waiting for that roof to get done. And, of course, all the kids all thought that they're basically preparing this whole roof for me to spend the night. And they're like, they're getting it ready for you. And uh, you saw the ribbons around or the, the, the lines around there. So, um, anyway, but I, I'm uh, going to do, be doing that tomorrow night. I was looking at the weather, and I couldn't do it tonight. It's supposed to be some rain and chilly and windy. and Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so tomorrow night, I'll get up there, me, my uh, teddy bear, and, uh, and uh, spend the night up there on the roof. So anyway, uh, pray for me, but I'll be up there and uh, right in the middle too. So if I roll, I have, I have some, some room there to go. So, a big hand for our principal. What a good sport, huh? Wow. So what, what are you going to do for next year is what I'm thinking about the new principal over here, right? Sleeping on the ground. Yeah, sleeping on the ground. Yeah. Well, I've got a bunch of sissies for staff members, don't I? But anyway, Brother Michael, speaking of sissies, um, <laughs> no, I'm just, ki I'm just kidding. Brother Rubio is going to come. Pray for us. Let's bow our heads. Let's ask God's blessing. I don't know if God can bless a mess like this already or not, but let's have church. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for today. And Lord, just want to thank you for another day of life and Lord, another opportunity to get to serve you. I pray, Lord, that you please fill a preacher with your spirit as he preaches to us tonight, Lord, but also that we would be spirit-filled listeners, Lord, ready to, to hear the message that you've prepared for us. I pray, Lord, that we would all leave this place refreshed and encouraged to go um, do more work for you, Lord. I thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray that you please meet with us tonight. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Brother Harris typically would be the one that reads our announcements and does our cross talk. And Brother Harris, you can see, is not here tonight, just taking a little bit of vacation time. And so he uh, deserves a little break, and so he's away tonight. And so uh, let me just real quickly talk to you about the things that are upcoming, give you a little bit of information. We always talk about that Friday nights at 7 o'clock, that is our RU recovery program. If you know someone dealing with addictions, please invite them to come, turn their name in to Brother DeJesus. It is a wonderful program. I want to tell you, last Friday night we had 50 on Friday evening, just a normal normal night. Not, not, a, not a big, you know, special push, just a normal night. And a lot of folks are being helped. So we praise the Lord for that. 
uh, the men's prayer breakfast last Saturday. We had 40 men that showed up and had a little breakfast and prayer time together, and that was awesome. Uh, our regular uh, Saturday morning prayer meeting will be this Saturday, and that's at 830, and that is always up in the Smith Conference Room right up here. I would encourage as many men as would come. Uh, I try to attend that meeting every Saturday uh, unless I'm out of town, and I would like to encourage you men to be there along with us to pray for our church. Uh, obviously, we know that Sunday school and uh, adult Bible fellowships always begin at 945. I do want to tell the parents to be thinking about this. Next, uh, a week from this Sunday, June 6, is Sunday school promotion. And that is the Sunday where every children's class moves up a grade. All right? And so this, this coming Sunday, the new teacher is actually going to visit their class, introduce themselves, and uh, let them know that they'll be the new teacher. And then the following week, you'll need to make sure you get the child to the right classroom. And you say, Pastor, I don't think I know where that is. A couple of things that you can do. At every entrance, here, there, there, and in the educational building, as soon as you walk in, right on the wall, there's a plexiglass piece there. There are two large um, maps there, or legends there, that talk about every single Sunday school class. We have over 30 Sunday school classes that meet, and it talks about where they meet, what room they're in, who the teacher is. So if you have any questions, you can look there, or you can stop by this welcome desk or the welcome desk in the educational building, and we'll make sure that your kids get to the right spot. All right, so again, promotion is just this one time a year, a little bit of switch o change so make sure that you're thinking about that uh, here with your children. And then, uh, 1045, I think we mentioned the Patch the Pirate Awards program. They're actually going to do a little program uh, for us, a little uh, some singing and some Bible memory and some awards on Sunday morning, and that's going to be a great time together as well. Vacation Bible School is just around the corner, June 20 through 23. We have flyers at the welcome desk there. There are also some sign-up sheets to help us with VBS. Please uh, go by and see what you can do to help us. And then the last announcement is kind of a soul-winning announcement. And that is not this Saturday, but the following Saturday, June the 5th, which is going to be our Super Saturday Soul Winning. That's our one time a month big push. We meet in room 102. However, Brother John Kidwell is going to have a little special soul winning time for all of the men. We're actually calling it a Fishers of Men Soul Winning Tournament. And again, of course, many of our guys, they're outdoorsmen, they're hunters and, and uh, fishermen. So it's going to kind of have a theme that day. But Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you what? Fishers of men. So 945, here's what we need. We need some experienced soul winners to come with some inexperienced soul winners so that we can go out door to door. And uh, some of these men, maybe for the very first time, give them some good experience with someone that has been soul winning before. Then we're going to come back and in the pavilion, there's going to be a lunch time and a little testimony time. And so if you have any questions, men, or can help us with that, please go by and see Brother John Kidwell. Now, before we sing the next song, Brother Kidwell is going to jump up and give you one little announcement about the fundraiser. Also on June 5th, that same Saturday, uh, of course, that'll be our teen car wash and yard sale fundraiser. Uh, so maybe after you get finished soul winning, after the lunch, uh, the guys, you can feel free, men, uh, to bring your vehicles on by, get it washed, and so forth. And so uh, I'm excited about that coming up. So uh, the whole church family, and there's been an announcement being uh, played over uh, the last couple Sundays, uh, but Saturday, June the 5th, from 7 o'clock to 2 o'clock, down at the Goodyear right here in Martinsburg, right here down Route 11. Um, so please feel free to come by, get your car washed. It's all donation-based, so you can just uh, donate whatever you think it, the car wash was worth. Um, and then we still have several tables left. I think four or five tables still left uh, back in the foyer. Um, if you'd like to go ahead and sign up um, and, and reserve a table that you could come bring your stuff and sell. Um, and then we only ask for a donation um, of that as well. So please uh, consider stopping by and helping with that. And then our camp is June the 28th uh, through July the 2nd. Okay, so coming up just about a month away. And uh, so please start praying for us. I'm excited about it. It'll be here before we know it. And uh, so please help me with that. All right, let's all stand. We'll sing one more time. Rock of Ages. We'll sing the first and last. Sing it with me on that first. Rock of Ages. Oh, while I draw this flea. 
play in it just a minute. Why don't you just turn around to say hello to somebody? We haven't done this uh, in the last couple of weeks. Just have a real quick greeting. Maybe meet somebody that you have not met and don't know. Tell them what your name is. Find out what their name is. And if you ushers have some cross talks, you can get ready for that. You got some cross talks, brother? Go ahead and be seated. You need a Wednesday night cross talk. Need a Wednesday night cross talk? Lift your hand. Our ushers will serve you. It's a green one tonight. Looks like this. It's this color right here. It's this color right here. Green. Lime green. All righty. And obviously, Brother Harris typically does this time of our service on Wednesday. But he had it all ready, and Mrs. MacArthur had it all printed. And so let me walk you through it. If you'll look at number four, number four, I'd like to let you know that my kiddo, Caitlin, and her husband, Matthew, are going to be here on Sunday. And they're coming up for a visit. It's Memorial Day. They both are Christian school teachers down in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, I think Friday is their last day. And so they're going to come up. And, you know, it made our world that they actually called and said, Can we come see you all? That just makes our hearts so full that our adult children want to come and see us. Amen? And uh, so they're going to be here on Sunday. They'll be singing for us, and that's always a blessing, isn't it? And uh, so I just wanted to mention that. If you'll pray for them for safety as they travel up on Friday evening. Would you look at the expectant mothers list there right next, number five, six, seven, and 8. And obviously uh, the baby dedication a couple of weeks ago, we had nine families dedicate little ones. And so these ladies here are still expecting and I, I just want to say praise the Lord for a young church and uh, young families having babies and rearing their children for the Lord. But right now, it also, right in that section, I'm going to ask you to add a name that everyone knows, but we, did, we already had this printed before we knew this was a major, major concern. But uh, you'll remember Mrs. Krista Lowe, right? Brother Chris Lowe, who was on our staff for five years. Uh, Miss Krista, of course, is expecting her first baby, and uh, we've talked about that. I think she's, I don't know, 30 weeks in maybe, but she has had some, maybe some of you have seen it on Facebook, but very serious, uh, not necessarily complications with the pregnancy, but always there's a, a concern about the baby. Uh, she's actually having emergency surgery. They took her to, or I don't know if she's there or not, Johns Hopkins is what I believe is going to happen. And uh, some, somewhat sometime tonight, emergency surgery. So let's pray, number one, for Krista, for God to watch over her, but also for that baby that is in her womb, okay? So let's really make that a, a matter of prayer tonight. And, uh, of course, uh, Miss Krista taught our, our third and fourth grade class here at MCA for those five years, and it's such a, a valued, valued uh, teacher. Uh, number 35, Brother Frank Woolard, uh, we talked about to him on Sunday, his appendicitis, he is home. I talked to Frank today. He is home, and he said he's feeling a little bit better every day, and he is thanking us for his prayers. Would you look at number 42, Brother Millard English, and I'm going to give you a, a quick announcement, and then I'm going to give you a prayer request about this. Uh, his son Bennett has been texting me the last uh, old month or so. He was uh, ready to retire, Brother Bennett was, and he said, as soon as I retire, I don't have to work Sundays I'm going to make sure dad gets to church. Now, of course, Brother Millard is 94, 95 years of age and not the best of health. And so they're planning to come uh, this Sunday. He told me they were going to be here this Sunday. And then I got an email today that Brother Eng Dr. English fell today and broke his collarbone. So that's not good uh, for a 94, 95-year-old man. So let's pray for Brother Millard English. All right, number 42. Of course, just a long-term member here uh, decades and decades, and one of our shut-ins now. Over on the inside, number 88 and 89, these are two new names that were turned in. Uh, Josh and Jessica, please remember them. Uh, let me highlight quickly the college students there. Baccalaureate is just in two Sundays. That's when we celebrate all of our high school seniors, and there'll be some of uh, those that are going off to college, so their names will be on this list in the fall season. Let's pray for these college students that are home, and maybe uh, some needing jobs and so let's pray about that, if you don't mind, please. I'm going to give you one more name right here, just to mark down under this list. And I see Trish right back there. 
Trisha's son, Ronnie Kreider, C-R-I-D-E-R. He's 42 years of age, and uh, he is having heart surgery. Is that correct? And when is that, Trish? On Friday. Heart surgery on Friday. Ronnie Kreider. That name is not listed here, so if you'd like to write that down, Mrs. Uh, Tr Trish Schultz, uh, this is her son. Please remember him. All right, would you look at the missionary list uh, tonight? And I want you to go down the, under the B's, and I want you to look at the name Nathaniel Burdine. Nathaniel Burdine. And guys, this is where I'd like that next picture. If you would show it on the screen there, please, for that new church plant. There we go. We just picked up um, Brother Daniel Burdine, which is the name right above him. That's his father. Uh, he's on his way to Nicaragua. Uh, this is the son, Nathaniel Burdine. And we just picked him up just a couple of months ago. And uh, the name of the church is Victory Baptist. If you want to look at the screen there, Victory Baptist Church of the Moshannon Valley. This is in Pennsylvania, just north of us, a couple of hours. And uh, just a, a great region there. Uh, not a real populated region, uh, they were telling me, but just a very unreached region. Just no, no gospel preaching churches. And so uh, this young man is working with a team. And actually, it started on the 24th. They were having uh, Get Acquainted meetings, uh, 24th, 25th. 26th and 27th, and then this Sunday, May 30, is their first official service. So I want you just to pray, if you don't mind, maybe, maybe beside Nathaniel's name there, write down Victory Baptist Church. And so this will be, they'll be having their first service on this coming Sunday, and we want the Lord to, to work and uh, to build His church as He promised that He would. Would you turn over on the back side? I want to mention that our church family of the week is the Moustakas family. And if you all are watching my, my way of Facebook tonight, please know that we're thrilled that their little daughter, Kathy, all right, you see Cadence and Kathy, both of these girls are at Martinsburg Christian Academy, and Kathy has trusted Christ as her Savior, and she's going to get baptized on Sunday. And she's asked Brother McRae before he leaves to baptize her, and obviously that's been her principle now for these years, and uh, little Kathy is one of the sweetest little girls, and the Mostakis family a part of our church ministry and I wanted to mention that there to you. All right. Again, we didn't touch on everything. Please make sure you take this, use it in your personal devotions, and uh, would uh, trust that you would do so. Let's get our Bibles out tonight, please. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand this evening. And I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Acts, please, chapter number 2. Acts and chapter number 2 this evening. I'm going to read our passage of Scripture. We're going to pray. And then uh, Brother Horton is going to sing our special for us this evening. And then I'm going to come and I'm going to continue in our series on the book of Acts here. Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 41, please, tonight. Acts 2 and verse number 41. Let's read verse 41 together. Ready? Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls Father, tonight we want to thank you for every element of this service. I've, I've enjoyed it from right at 7 o'clock when, when we began singing congregationally. I know whom I have believed. Lord, I'm thankful that I have a God who uh, I can trust and I can have confidence in. I can put my belief in. Thank you for being faithful to us. Lord, we saw our little ones sing tonight. We thank you for the potential of the future. Thank you for Martinsburg Christian Academy, our school, as we come to the ending of another year. And next year as we start our 50th year of, of uh, Christian education. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, the prayer time tonight. Lord, all these names that we have lifted to you or are printed on this page, please, Lord, especially be with Mrs. Lowe tonight. Uh, Lord, she was one of our own now for five years on our staff. Lord, touch her body tonight and touch that little baby, please. Please be good to them. They're faithful servants of yours. Lord, now tonight we come to the message. Lord, I'm thrilled about what you've laid on my heart to teach from a very familiar passage, Luke 2, for, or, or Acts 2, from verses 41 to 47. Lord, they're, 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 they're verses we've read often. We've heard many sermons from them. Help me tonight to make it fresh and, and uh, something new that we can, can look at tonight that will help our church. 2,000 years after this first century church uh, began and after it was empowered on the day of Pentecost. Help us to see some things that will help us to grow in our faith this evening. And Lord, I pray that you'll bless now. Bless the special music as it prepares our heart. Thank you for Brother Horton. 
Thank you for his faithfulness and teaching in our school. What a good example. What a man of faithfulness and character and consistency. And Lord, I pray that you'll use him tonight as he sings. Bless, I, I pray the Bible study in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. Today I faced a mountain oh so high And I do not know what's waiting on the other side But I know enough to know he'll see me through again I'm glad to know it's in the Savior's hands There will be grace, grace Savior's hands. Thank you, Brother Horton. Oh, we've got some amazing staff guys that just are so talented and such a blessing to this preacher right here to help carry the load. Well, we are up to number 43. Can you believe that? 43 Bible lessons out of the book of Acts, and we are finally getting to the end of chapter 2. And there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts, right? This is not boding well for us, is it? Anyway, we ha I've enjoyed it so very much. Let's see if I turn this thing on here. Acts of the Apostles is where we are. There we go. And uh, this is, we've been kind of looking at, at chapters 1 and 2 together. We talked about a new book, a new emphasis, a new experience, a new assurance. I'm not sure where number 5 is there. Five and six. There we go, a new apostle, a new army, a new gift of and for the gospel. Most recently, we were talking about Peter's sermon. We called it a new sermon from an old scripture. That was in Acts chapter number 2 there, really from verse number 14 down to verse number 36. It's all one sermon that Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. We looked at Peter. We said that here's where we were the, the last time together. We said uh, Peter was a man. We talked about how God was using him as a fisher of men. And we just kind of talked about that early in the service, didn't we? Peter was a fisherman. That's what he did for his trade. And he said, look, Peter, I want to use you. I want to use you in a very special way. Peter the man. Peter the, Peter's method of preaching, the mode and the model of the sermon, what the message was. We talked about the magnification and then the moment of truth. And that's where we were the last time that we were together. Now tonight we come to Acts chapter number 2. And Lord willing... 
we are going to finish this chapter here in this passage. Now, this is a familiar, familiar classic passage. I am certain if you have been in church any time at all, you've heard a preacher preach from Acts 2.41 that we just read, or Acts 2.47, or even the verses that are between. And so I don't know that I can say anything necessarily that is new or profound tonight, but I have asked the Lord to help me as I've outlined these verses. Again, we're just teaching Acts straight through, and so we've come to the end of chapter 2. This church was an amazing church, and so we're calling this, and this is the 10th uh, uh, tenth, uh, part of this outline in Acts 1 and 2, a new community called the church. A new community called the church. Not only is this passage classic, it is foundational. You know, often when I am talking to uh, someone who's just gotten saved or maybe someone who uh, attends our church and begins to ask uh, me about church membership, I often will go foundationally, I'll go to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Look at it again, our text. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were, what's that next phrase there? Yeah. Added to the church. You see, everything we do here at Shenandoah, we want there to be a biblical foundation for it. And so this is a foundational passage as it relates to, to what we would call church membership being added to the church. Do you and I all understand tonight that church saves nobody? Say amen right there. Jesus is the Savior. And then he says after you get saved, after you receive the gospel, which is what he's alluding there to in verse 41, then be baptized. And upon your baptism, you are then added to the church. I always tell folks there are three steps to church membership. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Can you give me a, a, a profession of salvation? What is your, ta your uh, testimony? What is your salvation story? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ and Him alone for your salvation? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and this is what I did, and here's where it was, and I was 15, or I was uh, 5, or uh, I was 28, or I got saved in a revival meet. whatever the story is. Then my next question is, have you been scripturally baptized? Now, wait a minute. How many of you know that baptism in many denominations is different than what we call scriptural baptism? Sprinkling is not baptism. Amen. Amen. Pouring some water over someone's head, that is not baptism. Baptism is by immersion. And that's what happened here on the day of Pentecost. They were baptized in deep water, if you want to say it that way. And upon that baptism, then you're added to the church. My point is, these verses are just very foundational. And so tonight, what may be elementary to some of you who've been saved forever... There are some brand new Christians that are in this room tonight. There are new believers, and you're new to church, and maybe new to uh, all of these things. And I believe this uh, passage tonight will help us all to push a reset button. So it's not only classic, it's not only foundational, it's also conceptual, and it's procedural, if I can use those words. These are the elements, if I can say it that way, of how this first century church began to grow. Now, let me, let me talk a minute about this, uh, the, the phrase that I've used in my outline here, a new community. Now, I know that maybe that word community has a little bit of a, uh, maybe a bad analogy, at least in the church world. You know, there are a lot of community churches, for instance, and that's what they call themselves. You know, uh, we could have a Martinsburg Community Church. And I understand maybe what uh, maybe is the thinking behind that. You know, we don't want to be a Baptist or we don't want to be a Presbyterian. We don't want to have a name. We're just going to say it's a church for everybody. And I, I guess I get that understanding. Uh, obviously, we're Baptist by conviction. Amen. And there's reasons, Baptist doctrine and Baptist faith. That's why this has been a Baptist church for all of these decades. My point is, is that I do believe, though, church is a community. Uh, I believe that there is community in a church. You know, when we say community, it kind of gives us the thinking of it's for everybody. You know, the church ought not just be for the folks who grew up here, for instance. Church, church should not be home just for the folks who uh, were here 50 years ago when this building got built. Church should be for anybody that walks in these doors to let them hear the gospel of Christ so they can be saved and added to the same body of Christ that we are uh, in, the, 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 what we would call the, the, the local church. It is a community, a community of believers. A community is, is are, are people that have uh, 
common interests and common likes and, and can fellowship. And we're going to see fellowship a little bit tonight. I believe church should have an element of community. But we also know that this community is not just a bunch of people getting together. It is actually a community that we're calling. And I want you to look at that last word because it's very important. And let me say, it's a Bible word. Community maybe is not a Bible word, but church is a Bible word. Church comes from the Greek word. You know this, ek, let's see, two Greek words actually, a called out assembly. Can I read for you what Mr. Strong's, if you ever have had a Strong's concordance, here's what Mr. Strong's said about the Greek word ekklesia, which is our English word church. I love this phrase here. The word church stresses a group of people called out for a special purpose. It designated, now I love the phraseology here. Listen to what he said. Church designated this new society of which Jesus was the founder, being as it was a society knit together by the closest spiritual bonds. Isn't that what a church ought to be? A society founded by Jesus Christ. He is our, our captain, amen. He is our leader. He is the founder of the church. He is our savior, and so when we are added to the church and added to the body of Christ or this community of believers, it ought to be something that is very close-knit. It is a society. It is a, a community of believers. And it was called for a special purpose. Look, church is not the same as a bowling league. Church is not the same as the Moose Club or the Elks Club or the Masonic Lodge. My point is, is that those are organizations of, of community. They may have people that enjoy, okay, bowlers enjoy bowling, right? There are softball uh, leagues. There are golf leagues. I, and I'm not saying that those things are necessarily wrong, but that's not what the church is. The church comes together for another reason. Now, let me ask you a question. Can church members come together and play softball? And we do that, right? Uh, can we come together and, and have, a, have a volleyball game or, or have a picnic? Yes, but that's not the whole reason that we get together is just to eat. Now, we are Baptist, and we have the best potlucks, amen? But that's not the only reason we meet. We meet for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We meet, someone should say amen right there. We meet for the propagation of the gospel of Christ. The reason we're together here tonight is because we can reach more people together than we can reach alone. So it's a community. So we're on the same team with each other. We're pulling the same rope with each other. And so, so church is this society that was founded by Christ. Now, can I remind you the exact story where we're reading right here? Jesus Christ has only been gone from this church for 50 days. I mean, this was just recent in their memory. They had seen the resurrection, right? Many of these folks had seen the resurrected Savior and the last uh, command, the commission that was left uh, in the ascension, you know, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So that is why the church exists. And so as we come to the end of chapter number 2, in verses 41, so we're going to kind of get into the text here, all right? So we're just going to kind of walk through it tonight. Again, it's so familiar, and I'm certain that many of you have heard uh, sermons or Bible studies on it. We have not studied it in this particular series. And so tonight, let me just give you a few thoughts that the Lord gave to me this evening. And so we come to verse number 41. And I want you to remember, and look at the first word, it says, then. All right, then they that gladly receive. So we can almost see that, that there's a, a different paragraph. Can we say it that way? It's kind of beginning. It's, it's after what has just happened. Now let me ask you a question. What has just happened in Acts chapter number 2? What is immediately preceding this that we studied a few weeks ago? Peter's, Peter's sermon. Was Peter's sermon about the gospel, yes or no? Did he talk about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? Absolutely he did. Peter was praying, and we, we spent a couple of Wednesday nights kind of dissecting that sermon. Remember, he reached back to the Old Testament. He quoted from Joel. Remember that? He, he quoted from David in Psalms, and he brought all of these prophecies of the Old Testament, and it was all about the Lord Jesus Christ. So he was bringing them to a point of, uh, of conviction. So notice, if you will, please, let's go back just a moment in verse 37, just to bring, you, bring, bring your mind back to where the end of that sermon uh, was. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter 
And under the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And remember we talked about how, watch this, how that every sermon needs to have a response. So you respond to what is preached. So the gospel is preached. Hopefully there are going to be responses. Uh, uh, the Bible is preached even to, to the believer. There needs to be a response in our heart, maybe a, a conviction that comes uh, into, uh, in, into our life, a change that takes place. And that is what is happening here. In fact, if you read verses 38, he gives the answer. Uh, Repent, comma, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. You shall receive the Holy Ghost. So that was that kind of that interim after the sermon, but before verse 41. So look at verse 41 again. He says, then, so after this sermon, immediately following this invitation that's, that Peter gives for people to be saved, I want you to notice what happened. Look at it. Then they that gladly received his word. Would you say that phrase with me? Ready? Gladly received his word. What was his word? Well, it wasn't just his words. They were the words of Joel, the, the words of David. Remember that? The words of the Old Testament. He was preaching the Bible. He was preaching about the resurrected Savior. And these words caused there to be some to what? Receive the salvation message. Now, wait a minute. We're going to find out in just a minute. Don't look down, but you probably already know. How many people ended up receiving this gospel message? 3,000. Can you imagine? That's quite an invitation, isn't it? That's, uh, I can't imagine all the altar workers that invitation took, right? 3,000. We're putting it in our vernacular there. That was a miraculous event. Remember tongues? Remember the, the languages? They heard every man in their own language. It was an amazing, miraculous thing. But I want you to notice the word there, gladly, just a moment. Maybe we kind of skip over it. Well, they, yeah, they received the word. But how did they receive the word? They received it gladly. Can I just stop and ask you to remind yourself of that first time that you heard the gospel? Or maybe that time that you finally let the gospel work in your life. Let, let me do a little survey here. Let me find out this. How many of you, you heard the gospel more than one time before you actually got saved? Bunch of hard-headed people. My <laughs> good. Bunch of stubborn, rebellious people. You know, obviously, I grew up in a great home, and early on, I was exposed to the gospel as a child, and I very readily received the Lord. I, I remember to this day, I can take you where, where, where it is, Cross Lanes, West Virginia, Swiss Drive, where the Mrs. Marion used to live down the street, uh, just before I came home from the hospital in 1968, they had just moved. Same little street in Cross Lanes, West Virginia. Maybe we'll get to be in, on the same street in heaven. Can we have a mansion in heaven on the same street? You, you good with that, Brother Marion? Amen. My point is, that's, the, that's a little house I got saved in as an as a almost five-year-old boy. When I think about that, that makes me glad. Did you gladly receive the word? I hope you did. And can I say, and I know it's Wednesday night, and, and, and maybe we don't have any unsaved people here, but if you are unsaved, would you please tonight gladly do the best thing you could ever do, and that is to receive Christ as your Savior. Amen. You can't get to heaven on your own merit. Church doesn't save you. Being good doesn't save you. There is one thing and one thing only that saves you, and that is faith and trust in the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on an old rugged cross for your sins. That's the gospel. Doesn't that make you glad? Shouldn't that make you glad? The Bible says, then they that gladly received his word. I, wanna, I wrote this down in my notes, and I want everybody to listen to it. I'm doing some teaching along the way. How does this affect us? I don't, think there needs, I don't think there was here, nor does there ever need to be, here's my point tonight, any undue coercion to get somebody to receive Christ. It's a free will choice. It's a free gift, but they have to accept it. I think too often, maybe in our fundamental churches, we, we've been a little too, and, and I'm all for being aggressive. Don't, don't misunderstand. I'm for confrontational soul winning. I'm from taking the gospel, talking to someone maybe that you've never heard before or never met before, knock on their door. Absolutely. Let's get the gospel to people. But I do not believe that people need to be strong-armed into praying some prayer. The Bible says they gladly received his word. Do you see that? They gladly received his word. So obviously this is kind of the soul winners. We want to be careful that we... And, and let, me, let me remind you. Let, let me prove my point. 
These people got saved immediately after a very lengthy sermon with a lot of scripture was used. Right? This was not one, two, three, repeat this prayer after me. Now, do I believe that salvation is simple? Absolutely. Do I believe that it's easy? Absolutely. My point I'm trying to make tonight is let's kind of follow the biblical model that there is a gladness of receiving the free gift of salvation. There's no coercion that is involved there. It's not a strong arm tactic. Look, you, you, may, you may be in sales in your secular career and there may be sales techniques to close the deal. I think we would be very careful that we're not just trying to close a deal with somebody. You know what I'm saying? We want to give them the gospel. We want to make it very plain. We want to be very thorough. We would like to bring them to the point of making a decision. Watch, but it is their decision to make. You can't get saved for somebody else, right? Or you can't pray the prayer of salvation for someone. Now, I'm not saying that, that we can't ever lead someone in a prayer. And there's a, a place for that, obviously. But my point is, is that they, they were gladly receiving. In fact, I wrote this down. Not only was there no coercion, it really was conviction of the Holy Spirit of God. It was conviction of the preaching that they heard. Verse 37, they were pricked in their hearts. There was conviction there. The Holy Ghost of God was taking this gospel message to bring them to a point of salvation. All right, let's look at the next part here. Then the Bible says that after they gladly received the word, they were baptized. I just wrote down very, very simply, immediate obedience. Do you see that baptism was immediate? They didn't wait a day or, or a week or three months or five years. They got baptized. Amen. Baptism is meant to be a show on the outside of what has already happened on the inside. Let me just stop and say, those new believers that just dragged their feet on getting baptized and, and uh, uh, you know, following the Lord in this, this first step of obedience, they're not going to grow in other areas of their life either. Because baptism is the first step. Baptism doesn't make anybody saved, right? We understand. You don't get baptized in order to, you know, keep the, the salvation thing going. No, you, you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The transaction is complete. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, forgives your sin. And he says, now because you've been saved and the Holy Ghost lives within you, let's now take this first step to identify to the world that I am a Christian. Amen. I'm identifying with Christ. That like as Christ. And we went to Romans chapter 6, verses 3, 4, and five, what a great passage. I just want you to see it was immediate. You know, sometimes, watch, sometimes fundamental Baptist churches get criticized that maybe someone might walk an aisle and get saved in a church service and they immediately go to the baptistry to get baptized. Well, that was kind of the model here. They received, they got baptized, they were added to the church. Do you, do you see that? Now, I'm not saying, again, a strong arm. I am not saying that they, if they don't understand what baptism is, and let me just parenthesize here. Can I talk to the parents just a moment? I would give a little parental advice if your child is very young when they get saved to maybe let a little time go by so that they don't tie getting saved and getting baptized as one event. Because you don't want them thinking that getting baptized was what saved them. Does that make sense with little children? That's, just, that's a parental thing. I've been doing this for 31 years. Uh, obviously, my children were saved when they were young. I was saved when I was young. But my dad very, very wisely let about six months go by between my, my salvation and my baptism. They were explaining it to me. They wanted me to understand it. So that's just a little, little bit of teaching along the way there uh, about our own children. All right, but I want you to see that baptism was an, imme an immediate obedience. Notice the next phrase then, what happens after baptism? They were then added. It says, the same day there were added unto them. Now I want you to notice, added unto them. Go down to verse 47. Let me tie it together. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the... So who was the them in verse 41? The church. Does that make sense? Added to the church. The church was already in existence. Remember that? Remember we studied that Pentecost wasn't the start of the church. The church really started three years earlier when Jesus started bringing his disciples, this called out assembly. And now Acts 2, uh, the church is being empowered and added to, added unto them. 
added unto who? The apostles, the disciples, the believers, the women. Go back to chapter 1 and verse number 14. You remember this uh, passage. We talked about it. Chapter 1, verse 14. They, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication uh, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And then uh, those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Then the Bible says there were 120 of them. So that was the church then. So the church was already in existence and already slowly growing. And now, now we see God adding to the church 3,000 souls. In fact, let me, let, me, let me say this in my notes here. Listen carefully. The church is meant to grow. We are meant to grow. In fact, we're, to, we're meant to grow organically. What do I mean by that? Now, is there a place for transfers of membership? Maybe someone moves from one area to our area, and they a church of like faith, and, and we receive them by what we call transfer of membership. And that's wonderful. That's great. And we're glad that God sends us that. But that's not the only way that this church is supposed to grow, not biblically. You know how we're, how we're supposed to grow? New people getting saved. Say, listen, listen, church, new people getting saved. Amen. That's how this church grew. Folks got saved. They heard the gospel, again, from preaching. The Spirit of God worked on their heart. There was conviction. They gladly received it. They got baptized, and they were added to the church. The church is meant to grow. The church is not supposed to stay small, us four and no more. It's not a club. It's not, a, again, a society of just, you know, just the few, few of us here. A church is supposed to have as many people as can get reached with the gospel of Christ. Amen. Y'all with me tonight? Guess who's going to do that growing? This, this Wednesday night crowd right here. The Sunday night crowd, the folks that are soul winners, those workers that I met with, about 80 of them tonight, uh, there at 615. Those are the Sunday school teachers and the bus captains and the folks that work in RU and the folks that are out there on the front lines meeting people that need to hear the salvation story. When's the last time you went soul winning? When's the last time you presented the gospel to somebody? When's the last time you came on a Super Saturday soul winning? When's the last time you went with the New Testament and knocked on the door? When's the last time you tried to go out of your way to get the gospel to somebody? That's the way church is supposed to grow. All right, didn't like that point. We're going to move on. <laughs> and it grew exponentially, 3,000 people in one day. That's pretty exponential growth, isn't it? Now, we have a pretty large church. You know, average church size in America is, they say, 75 to 100. You know, we have about 500 people that come to our church on any given Sunday. Thank God for that. Amen. But we got more room. Yes, sir. The balcony's getting a little bit fuller on Sunday morning. We got more room. Amen. We got all kinds of buildings. We got 35 acres. I think we probably can keep growing, reaching people. I know we got more room on the buses. I know we've got more room in RU. We got more room. To reach more people, souls. Look at verse 42 quickly. It says, and they, and then they, and they. So who's the they? The they is verse 41. These, these new believers that just have gotten saved, baptized, and added to the church. And they continued steadfastly. Well, that's a great thought right there. Now look this way. Have we all seen somebody that comes and they make a profession of salvation and Maybe even get baptized, and, and then we never see them again. Does that happen, yes or no? More than we want to, to admit. That does not necessarily mean that they did not get saved. Listen to me carefully. That is because I, I can't judge his heart or her heart. That's between them and the Lord, right? But there does seem to be a correlation and a tie with someone who, when salvation takes place and Changes begin to happen from the inside out organically because the Spirit of God now is within them. That there is going to be, and I think we see it right here, there is going to be a continuing, a steadfast continuing. Continuing in what? Well, we could say a lot of things in our vernacular, in the way we do church that I think is important. Let me ask you a question. Is, 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 it, is it important for a new Christian that gets saved and baptized, is it important for them to continue to come back to church services? Yes. Was well, the first service that they got saved, is that enough for them for the rest of their lives? Not if they're going to grow. 
Now, if they're going to stay a baby Christian, but if they're going to grow, verse 42 says, they continued steadfastly in what? The apostles' doctrine. They learned, look, look at me. This is why we make such a big deal here about discipleship. Everybody say that word with me. Ready? Discipleship. It's the making of disciples. Now, we have a program, obviously, and, and we have two programs. We have an eight-week program, and we have a 24-week program. Why? We're serious about making disciples here at Shenandoah Bible Baptist Church. I don't want to just see a bunch of people saved. I want to see a bunch of people get saved and continue. Isn't that, isn't that what we just read? They continued steadfastly. They, they started coming to church, and they stayed coming to church. Well, wouldn't that be a great thing? That's a novel idea, isn't it? I got saved when I was five. I've been in church every Sunday and Wednesday for the last 50 years, 47 years. I just, I've kind of made, I've got this bad habit. It's called church. Now you're saying it's because you're the preacher, you know, you get paid to come. No, I don't get paid to come. I get paid to work when I come, amen? My point is, if I wasn't a pastor, if I just had a heart for God, if I'm just a church member, I'd want to be a part of that place that helps me grow in my faith. Amen. And that's what we see here. They're continuing in doctrine. We mentioned discipleship, how important. I want you to notice next that the goal of discipleship is for faith and fellowship. Look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Do you see the spiritual elements there that they're beginning to learn about? Does a new Christian know how to pray? Not, not, probably not well. They may don't, don't understand a prayer. They probably don't understand uh, uh, the, the relationship with God and what that means. They probably don't understand about Bible reading and a devotional life and these are things that are taught. Now, how are they best taught? Have you ever heard the phrase, more is caught than is taught? Would you say that phrase with me? More is than is. Now, we can have teaching times, Sunday school. We can have teaching times, discipleship. But you know what, the, what a new Christian needs more than anything? Everybody look at me. Needs as they come to this body and they start interacting in fellowship with you, they see the real deal. They see you talking about getting your prayers answered. They see you coming faithfully to church. They see you, watch me, they see you responding to an invitation. They see you coming to their home to visit with them. What are they doing? They're, they're fellow, they, they've joined this body, if we can say it that way. They've been added to this body. And the Bible says, look at verse 42 again. I, I love this. Doctrine and fellowship are, are hand in hand right there. We've got to get to know these new Christians. We need to let them get to know us. So the point here is, is this first church began to grow so organically and that many of them stayed and became steadfast because maybe there was some fellowship going on. There was some doctrine going on. There was some praying going on. Quickly, verses 43 to 45 is, is because the book of Acts is so transitional, and I, I said that early on in the study, verse 43 talks about wonders and signs that were done by the apostles. Remember that in verse 43? Uh, speaking in tongues was one of those. Remember, healing was another one of those. Obviously, we know this was a transitional time, and God was using these signs and wonders that was done by the apostles to help these new believers to to really understand the, the supernatural nature of Christianity. Verse 44 goes on to say that all that believed were together and they had all things common. And they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Let me just stop right here. Here's what I want to teach real quickly about this. This does not mean that this, because it's found in Acts chapter number 2 here, again, because it's this transitional time that's just following the uh, miracle of tongues, the miracle of Pentecost, the, uh, the exponential growth of the church, there was something that happened on the inside. The Bible said that they began to be very generous with each other. The Bible says that they, they had all things common. Do you see that where it says that in verse number uh, 44? They had all things common. They sold their possessions, parted them to all men. Uh, that kind of sounds a little bit like communal living. 
Here's my point. Nothing in the scripture here says that this is the model for us to follow in this arena right here. I think what it shows is, is these brand new believers of this amazing thing called Christianity, the Spirit of God coming upon them and, and, and or dwelling within them and, and taking these steps to identify with Jesus Christ that it became so real to them. And it said, look, if, if, I, if I have something that you need, then you, let me help you here. Let me meet a need. Can I ask you a question? Shouldn't that be the way Christians are with each other? I mean, isn't that the the kind of attitude, let me say that, the kind of attitude that we should have. It didn't say, there's no, there's no, no command here to live communally. All right? There's no command that says, all right, when you're a Christian, take all your money and you put it all in one pot and everybody just kind of lives. No, I understand that that's what is being taught here. But again, Acts is very transitional. It was, I think it's just showing the attitude these people had towards one another. And they said, look, I, for whatever reason, and I don't even know you, but I love you. And I want to meet your needs. And, and I want to fellowship with you. And I, I want to spend my life with you. Why? Because it's a community. And shouldn't church be a community of just getting along with each other? I am so tired of division and strife and conflict. And I'm, I'm tired. If there's one thing that I hate about my job, it's that I always feel like I'm putting fires out and this and that. And can we just not have some fellowship of, of brothers and sisters in Christ Look past some of the junk and the conflict and see the big picture. Look what God's doing here. I don't know how they could look and say, God's doing something really big. 3,000 people just got saved. And so this attitude was, was, there was a change in attitude. Let me say it that way maybe. As we come close to the end here, look at verse 46. And they, so it's this, this same group of people here, and they continuing. I love that. Remember that we, they were continuing up in verse 42. Now they're continuing in verse 46. Continuing daily with one accord. Well, there's unity again. One accord. In the temple. I'm going to stop and say, so they, they assembled. They were in the same place. Can I just stop and say again to Facebook and YouTube, that's not real church. We did it for a reason, for a purpose. It's not what God intended long term. Come back to the house of God to assemble. That was the model. They came. They continued. They were with one accord. They were together in the same place. They broke bread together, the Bible says. They were in house, in house to house. They did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Their lives were intertwined with each other. Look at me, and I'm going to try to bring this to a close. This is what I mean by community. Can I just say, Shenandoah is a lot like this church in the manner of, some of you I see seven days a week. And some of you see me seven days a week. And I know it's a little too much. I get it. I, I know that's what you're thinking. It's about five days too much, right? But, you know, those of you who have, say, your kids at our school, okay, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we see you. You're, we have the, the MCA 500, we call it out here, with all the cars and how they... They come to drop their kids off and pick their kids up. And, I mean, there's cars parked all the way. And we have 130 students this year uh, in our school. And, and, man, it's a great thing. It's families that are taking advantage of this thing we call the church. This thing we call the Christian school that is an outgrowth of Martinsburg Christian Academy, an outgrowth of Shenandoah Bible Baptist Church. What an amazing arm of our ministry to reach people. You understand the, the couple that sat right back here Sunday morning that came Three weeks ago, walked the aisle and got saved. They came back again this past Sunday. We reached them because their grandson is at MCA. We never would have reached them had there not been some tie. Don't tell me that, that MCA cannot be used of God to reach people right where they are. How important to, to see this, this community. That's the, that's the word, I'm, the, the picture of a church family. Being together and, and, and letting new people come in. All right, if we can say it that way. And so we get then to the end of verse 47. The Bible here says that they were praising God. They were having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Did you just notice that word daily? That's what I was talking about. We're here seven days a week, 